there. Just learning still all the tools here, chat, F and, F and A, interesting. Yeah, question. So we've got someone here from New Zealand. People have got up early in the morning um, to, to hear you guys, which is amazing. Wow. We really appreciate that, guys. We just need to make sure because questions are dropping in that we can read the questions and talk. Uh, You'll be asked the questions. Okay, I'll okay. send so, the questions okay, to so you. Somebody's re okay, okay, got it. Yeah, At the moment, know. it's easy for you to read, but once you're all chatting, you'll find it a bit more challenging. Okay, yes, exactly. Rick's not here yet. All right, I'm going to text him as well. Yeah. Well, if I can, I'm going to call him and go offline for a second. So Rick um, uh, got confused with time zones. Deborah, can you send him the link quickly? He's coming now. <laughs> yep, I'm going to send it to him right now. So he's in front of his computer. He just mixed up time zones, which can happen. Actually, it's my biggest problem in these days is literally days and times. It is so confusing. Even when you're in the same time zone, it's confusing at the moment. Yeah, no, no so, and, and if it's, I don't know the days, and it's all the same. <laughs> it's it, true. I'm really enjoying, though, losing track of the days, honestly. It's, it's a nice treat. Yeah, and a sort of, I think me, I'm traveling normally so much that I think my body, sometimes I go to bed at like 6, and sometimes I go to bed at 2 a.m., I think my body is mirroring, like he's like, okay, I'm gonna pretend I'm traveling because I enjoyed it. Well, it's good that he's around. That's good news. <laughs> yes. I just called him and then he said, I've got to get off, I've got a call from Germany. So he, he hung up on me to answer your phone call. Okay, but it's good so he's around, <laughs> so he's coming. Yeah, I'm sure he'll be here very soon. I've just sent it. Everyone grab it, please. Maybe we should say hello to everybody because I think we're overdue with starting time. So okay. hello, everybody. Um, yeah, should we go ahead and start or do you want to hang on for Rick for a few more minutes? To... Should, uh, let's wait, he's coming in a second. Perfect. Yeah, for me, these Zoom meetings have almost become a way of virtually traveling. Somebody said, tell jokes. I just have non-PC jokes, so I can't tell jokes. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, my, I'm, uh, Rick is here. I'm sorry I'm late, but uh, I can't start my video. It's uh, turned off by the host, I think. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's working in a second. And you, you, I think you've seen as me, right? I see you, yeah. 
No, no, no. I think it says Christian. It says my name in your thing, right? Oh, oh. Well, I guess we're uh, uh, <laughs> we're one now. <laughs> we already <laughs> we're already getting confused as one. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> try your <clears throat> Rick. Try your video again, please. Okay. There we go. Hey, Rick. Okay. Perfect. Hi. So, so there are two Christians, uh, but the one is Rick Doblin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to hold a test at the end of this to see if anyone can figure out who is who. Yeah. Um, everyone's waited long enough, so we're going to get straight into it. I'm going to pass it over to Mark, Dr. Mark Bronstein, who's moderating, and let you guys just dig in and go for it. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Welcome to the first in a series of webinars from SciTech. We're pleased to be raising money today for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAPS. SciTech is an educational and networking platform in the psychedelic space, driving clinical treatment, research, and innovation forward on a global level. I'm Dr. Mark Bronstein, a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist in the US, and I've been working with plant medicines for over 20 years, focusing on helping patients and clinicians look beyond the traditional paradigms of mental health. I'm blessed to be on the Scientific and Medical Advisory Board for SciTech, and I'm excited to be here kicking off this webinar series with these psycho psychedelic pioneers. I'd like to start by introducing Dr. Rosalind Watts. She is the clinical psychologist and clinical lead of the Imperial College of London Psilocybin for Depression Study, and has created a model of psychedelic therapy called Accept, Connect, and Embody. Next, I'd like to introduce Christian Angermeyer, He's the founder of Atai Life Sciences, bringing his experience, vision, and ethics from the corporate and biotech worlds into the psychedelic and mental health spaces. And lastly, for the man who needs no introduction, Rick Doblin, the founder and executive director of MAPS. He's been paving the runway for the rest of us in this work since 1986. Thank you so much all for being here today. I'd like to start off with a question for Dr. Watts. Rosalind, what do you see as the most pivotal moment in psychedelics in your career thus far? I think um, when I first started out working as a psychedelic researcher, um, like many people, I was full of the um, enthusiasm and awe for this incredible tool and the power it could have. And I came from, um, a national health service background where I was working as a clinical psychologist um, working in talking therapy so I was amazed when I started working in psychedelic research and I realized that actually these these tools can really catalyze such amazing transformation in people and it was so exciting to work with people and see these huge changes um, especially coming from a background where talking therapy can take a very long time to see changes so I was very excited at, at the beginning and I still am but I think probably the the pivotal moment for me was realizing um, I did a qualitative research study at the end of the first psilocybin for depression study we did at Imperial, so a few years ago now. Um, and I did some qualitative research where I interviewed all the participants in that study about their experiences of psilocybin treatment. And I think it was such an important piece of work for me because I realized the complexity of this work. And also, I guess, I think the pivotal moment was really, was really realizing about how people feel when the depression comes back. And realizing that it's you know psilocybin isn't a magic bullet it's not a one uh, take some capsules of psilocybin and that you're going to be you know you're going to be changed forever it's um it's very much a process and i think recognizing um that that process of what of what happens when the depression comes back was really the moment that really um shaped the rest of my career and it's certainly is shaping the direction that i want to go in now so just realizing that the depression does come back and it's not a silver bullet, that realization was really pivotal for you. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think when I started, I'd, I'd read some of the research with people saying, I think from the research from Johns Hopkins in, in the States, you know, with um, amazing reports of people saying that, um, you know, it was, it was amongst the most five most significant life experiences and it was you know, life changing. And certainly we do see that. But I think it was that recognition that um, maintaining that change change uh, for people with treatment resistant depression is 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 really it's a real challenge and um yeah and, and the nuances of the therapeutic model as well 
Um, and I think that for me, that's really inspiring. It, it's not a, a kind of, um, it's not something that makes me feel disillusioned. It just makes me feel motivated to find, uh, find new ways of working with people that can maintain that change for longer. What have you found is key to maintaining that change? I think for me, that's the kind of the golden question, and that's really what I want to dedicate the rest of my career to answering. We're right at the very beginning of even thinking about that question, and um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be fascinating answering it, but it's going to be something that we need to do together as a community because we're going to. There, I mean, it's so complex. It'll be different for different people, different populations, different therapeutic approaches, and it's going to be expensive. You know, some, for somebody to stay well, um, I think is, is a process that requires connected community support and, and ongoing treatment, I think, too. So I'm really confident we can find ways of doing it. I know we can, but it, it is going to be, um, it's going to be quite a journey and something that we all need to do together, I think. Yeah, figuring out a way to make it affordable is really important. Yeah. Um, Rick, I'm wondering if, if you had any thoughts uh, on what it takes to maintain those changes that, that come up during this treatment. Yeah, well, I think one question I was just going to uh, sort of ask Roz about is that um, I think both Compass and USONA are checking a one session model, you know, in the sense that you only get one psilocybin session with preparation and integration afterwards. And so my concern has always been, um, is that going to be sufficient? And so what we find is that uh, with MDMA for PTSD, it's a three session model. So I think that we're going to end up probably post approval with uh, a two session model. Some people will need more, some people only need one. But I think for sustaining it, you also need to go you know, deeper during the therapeutic process itself. So, so I do have some questions about just the one dose miracle cure kind of model. And there will be improvements. We see that most of the improvement, more around 50 or 60% of the improvement comes after the first session. And so there's maybe, you know, 20, 25, 20% or so, something like that after the second session and after the third session, these are on averages. So the one part is to deepen the therapeutic process so that it lasts longer. So you teach people how to process anxiety, how to process trauma so that they can heal themselves. I mean, that's the whole essence of our method is we're teaching people to heal themselves. Is that the integration work that people talk about, Rick? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. And I think that there's um, this process, what we see with trauma at least is that, and I'm sure that there's, um, it's true for a lot of other disorders, is that um, particularly addiction is that, you know, when, when people are anxious or fearful, they shut down and that keeps the problem there. It doesn't help them solve it. But if they learn that they can process it, then they can continue to do that on their own. And that, that is part of this integration process. And so um, I think that what we find at the two-month follow-up is that people do pretty well, but at the 12-month follow-up, they're doing even better. So that's where we're not providing any support at all. But people have learned this process. I really that. Yeah. That's so inspiring to hear, and I, I've seen those results before for MGMA work, and yeah, that's, that's, it's incredible. I think, unfortunately, for depression and psilocybin for depression, we might see a very different, um, a different scenario um, where we, we maintain relationships with our participants far beyond the end of the study, the six-week point, and we found that that aftercare process, we have a meditation teacher that will su provide support for people at the end of that six-week period, and so because we have this contact with people, we can really see what, what is happening with them. And the depression comes back with people very strongly so, and usually after a couple of months. And that is the, the norm, I would say. Wow. Some people need to be able to maintain um, a state of feeling kind of depression free or at least feeling like they have some ways of managing it for much longer. But we see much more of this kind of, you know, couple of months of being depression free. And then even with the meditation support and even the community structures we've put in place, the depression comes back and sometimes people feel that having experienced psilocybin and seeing what it can do and what life is like when they are depression free when the depression then comes back they can actually feel much worse than they did before because they, they have no way of getting it again and um for most of them it's not you know there's no which is obviously very key for this whole question of mainstreaming um but at the moment this moment in time if they can't access it again they can feel sometimes worse than they did before they tried it 
What do you think about a two session model? I mean, to, or, or have, have you tested that? Maybe the depression doesn't come back as quickly or at all, or, or how do you think about that? So the current model that we do is, is a two session model in the current study. So it's one wow. session, then three weeks later, they have another session as well. And then um, we have, I would say, minimal therapeutic support, kind of preparation and integration. It's the, the minimal that I would say is, is safe to, to go ahead with that kind of work. Um, but I would say that still, I mean, we, we haven't got the results here. We've only just finished the study. So it will be very interesting to compare um, the, you know, the two dose model with the, the previous setup, which was one kind of start of practice dose and then one high dose. So it'll be interesting to see the differences. Um, but I, I feel very much from, from what we've seen in our team of this study that uh, what we, we're, we're gonna need more. And I know it's very expensive and we've got to find a way of making it possible, but we, we're probably going to need more than two sessions and, and, and intensive therapeutic support, I would say, in order for these changes to be maintained and for the work to be safe. Because the other thing we saw too is just the, the variety of different responses and how difficult it is to predict how people will respond. We're starting to learn more about um, when it doesn't work, when people don't feel anything, when there are, you know, I'd say risk issues involved, boundary issues, safety issues, all, you know, all the complexities. I'm sure, you know, with MAPS, you're way ahead of us in a way with, with understanding all of that with your MTMA work. But yeah, I think in order to maintain the safety and the clinical effectiveness, we're going to need models that have more wow. rather than less. So, uh, Christian. Uh, I'm curious what you think about this. As we hear that it's not a silver bullet, it's not about one treatment or two treatments or maybe even six, but about ongoing care and keeping people involved and, and motivated to keep doing this work. Uh, I'm curious um, what ideas you have about how we can present this to the public and get it out to the masses. Well, let's not many, yeah, so where do we start? So, so first I think, once it is approved, and by the way, it's always like I have always these three, let's say, hats. Uh, the one is like, as, as Rick mentioned, the company called Compass, which is a, a company. My, I have this holding company, which is called Atai, um, and we own a stake in Compass, and we have other psychedelics uh, as well. Yeah, so I can a little bit talk about Compass, but I cannot represent them. Yeah, uh, and then also I always want to make clear because my private views are maybe a little bit more um, um, yeah, private, but like it's always uh, complicated if you talk as a as a pharma or biotech guy because you always need a little bit to be FDA compliant. But what I would say is like, I think one important step is what we're all working on is to get it approved, yeah, so that doctors can work with it and therapists, and then ultimately that's the huge hurdle. And then once it is approved, then the the therapists have a lot of discretionary uh, freedom to say, oh. Do I use it once? Maybe I use it more often. Yeah. Well, what's so, the it? <laughs> I'm sorry. What's the it? Say again. You said once it's approved. What are you talking uh, about? The, the drugs, the drugs, psychedelics. Like. But uh, well, what about ketamine and cannabis? Well, I wouldn't say cannabis as a psychedelic, and I'm personally not um, not uh, familiar in deeply with cannabis. But take ketamine. Already now in ketamine. Yeah, doctors can decide, do they use it once? Do they use it six times? Obviously there is a, a recommendation, but ultimately once it's legal as a medication, every single therapist can tailor the therapy to the needs of the respective uh, patient. Um, so I'm not that worried that once psilocybin, MDMA uh, will be approved, ketamine is already approved, the, the market and the therapists will adapt to the needs of, and I think every patient is different. Yeah, uh, I have seen in my personal uh, friends group, for example, I've seen remarkable success with people taking it once, yeah, and then not again. And I have seen people who who sort of need and want it regularly and and uh, profit a lot by by really doing it regularly, even once a year. I Meaning I'm doing it once a year. Yeah, not because I need it, but I think I profit from it, and it helps me. Um, developing further. I, if I mean it, I mean, I mean psilocybin. Um, the second is, I think what is important is uh, coming to the cost question, because obviously, indeed, as in, in, the, in the medical setting, if you use a therapist, that always uh, uh, imposes a cost, yeah, because you have the clinic, you have the therapist. So, so we, we means both the Thai and Compass are working on um, also a lot of digital uh, support. Yeah, obviously digital stuff cannot replace the therapist, but therapists can use a lot of digital solutions. It starts with chat solutions to stay in touch with the, the patient even beyond the session. 
Yeah, so you can do a lot of integration of technology yeah, to make that post integration work much better. It makes sense. It does. I mean, I, I think that coronavirus right now is speeding up how exactly. we're, now we're learning all that actually we can do a lot and we have to do a lot and in technology and maybe we can sort of use that as well for psychedelics or post integration uh, therapy. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me say that there's some um, questions for us with the FDA as to whether they will put a lifetime limit on the number of uh, MDMA sessions people can receive. And I don't know if they're thinking about this for psilocybin either, but um, the kind of data that we're getting about toxicity, because there has been this whole issue with neurotoxicity with MDMA, um, is sufficient, we've been told so far, for 10 or 12 administrations. But if we, so the, the FDA may indeed at some point say they want to put a lifetime limit on the number of sessions, which would require patient registry and all their other things. Psilocybin doesn't have those same kind of uh, neurotoxicity issues, so there may not be that requirement. So that's just something to keep in mind is that once it's approved, there may be some limits on the ability of therapists to continue to prescribe the psilocybin or the MDMA. So for ketamine, for example, it doesn't seem like there's any limits and that does, ketamine for depression seems to fade for a lot of people and people are getting many multiple uh, ketamine sessions and it, it, it would be more effective with therapy. More and more people are trying to combine ketamine with therapy, but um, I just wouldn't automatically assume that um, it'll be unlimited number of sessions post-approval. Um, because there's but, risks. But, but that's where you want to look at the risks and the benefits. And when yeah. you're talking about suicidality and the fact that some of these psychedelic treatments can be life life saving, that's where the maybe there's the limits can be relaxed. Because yes, there might be neurotoxicity with MDMA or bladder toxicity with with ketamine. However, it's saving people's lives. Then the risks outweigh the benefits. Yeah, th there's not really neurotoxicity from MDMA in the doses we use, the frequency we use. And I think if we were to spend um, a certain number, four or five million dollars more on additional toxicity studies, we could address the, the concerns about multiple administrations of MDMA beyond 10 or 12. But we're trying to do it as efficiently as we can now. But yeah, you're right, Mark. It's, it's always going to be a risk-benefit calculation. And I'm curious, man, what, when you say neurotoxicity, what... What concerns do you have with uh, increased duration of MDMA treatment? Um, zero. I mean, I'll just say personally, I've done it 125 times in my life. And you're um, still standing. <laughs> and I'm still standing, and there's way more people that have done it longer. The, the, the best uh, example study was done out of Harvard, funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and it was long-term heavy ecstasy users. And it was the perfect population because they were um, – we call them the fallen Mormon study. So a bunch of uh, Mormons in Utah, before the church said that ecstasy was on the bad list, they'd um, used ecstasy a lot, you know, many, many times, but they'd not used alcohol, tobacco, nicotine, um, marijuana, all, all these other drugs. So it was the, the most isolated population of people that had just done heavy ecstasy and the neurocognitive findings um, were very reassuring. So I'm really not concerned about neurotoxicity, particularly in our um, therapeutic setting and the doses we use. I mean, if you do it days and days in a row without stop, you know, you can get problems if you use super high doses. But I think in our therapeutic context, I'm not really worried about it, nor is the FDA. It's just that if we wanted to do more than 10 or 12 administrations, we'd have to do a whole set of additional uh, safety studies, mostly in animals. Thanks. Roslyn, I'm wondering about side effects with uh, psilocybin. Um, so the only side effect that we've found in our study so far is a headache. Uh, we need to analyze the data from the, the study that we've just completed to, to look into that more. But we can say that in terms of the uh, physical side effects, that's, you know, it's, it's wonderful that a headache is the only thing we've seen. And it's usually something that the participants, you know, feel you know, is quite acceptable to them. They've had a headache before. They, they know it's kind of it's not too frightening for them. Um, so it has an amazing side effect profile. Um, I would say what we've seen more is a kind of psychological side effect in the sense that you know it can be this huge opening to this other way of feeling and being and relating to other people and people come into the study and they you know when the treatment goes really well they um which, which it usually does you know they they usually have a good response they 
um, they can feel more connected to themselves and other people and much more sensitive and much more open. And so I would say one of the kind of psychological side effects is then going back to their usual societies and their usual networks, feeling very sensitive, very open and feeling, you know, like thin skinned and you know, their senses can be more acute. They can, things feel more vivid and more intense. So if you go back into an environment that isn't really optimal, um, then that increased sensitivity and increased openness, I would say almost is a slight side effect. And it's something that people could be aware of. So I, I think that they're hyper aware of that, actually. I think people's anxiety about having a, a bad trip is one of the primary barriers of access for these medications. Oh, I, when, sorry, when we I talk mean bad trip. I, I didn't mean, um, I meant sen like even after a very good experience, this increased sensitivity to your environment, not, not a bad trip. I mean, after people have had a really good experience, increased sensitivity afterwards. Very, very different from a bad trip. Very different from a bad trip, yeah. That being said, I think that anxiety over the bad trip is keeping a lot of people from accessing these medications. And, and I'm curious what you guys think, how, how we can present this to the mainstream in a way to get them to accept this with less anxiety and fear. Yeah, uh, let, let me just quickly say that there's there's one approach that I think doesn't make that much sense, which is that MindMed has now bought uh, Matthias Lichty's LSD data, and part of his data was Catanserin, which it can uh, sort of diminish, uh, reduce an LSD trip. So they're promoting it as a way to abort a bad trip, and they are trying to patent this idea. And I think from a therapeutic perspective, it's a terrible thing, because what we do not tranquilize people, that do you, do you tranquilize them or you bring them out of it, they get the message that they can't handle it. It's much better them to endure it. In the future, I think the best thing for a bad trip would be a half a dose of MDMA because that turns it, reduces the fear and helps people process the things that they're really scared of. So I think rather than say, you get a bad trip, we'll just take you out of it is not really a good approach. And it's more like we will support you through it and you will learn that you can endure. If you can't overcome, you can at least endure and people can get strength from that. But this idea that MindMed is now gonna to try to patent an approach for taking people out of an anxious uh, LSD experience, I don't think it's the right way to go. Yeah, I, I totally agree on that. I mean, from a personal experience, yeah, the, uh, my sort of bad trips, but I, I don't like the word actually bad trip. I think they were extremely challenging, yeah, yeah. but they were, they were actually the most, um, the most, yeah, what do you say, inspiring or where I learned the most, yeah, maybe the hard way, yeah, but they were the ones who sort of really, uh, yeah, helped me the most. So education, I mean, it sounds like educating the population will be really helpful to decrease their anxiety. Because really what we're talking about, how, how can we affect the most change unless we can get this out to, to the masses, right? I'm curious, Christian, what ideas do you have about really blowing up access for this, man? Well, I think, meaning because if I read uh, the chat, meaning that's, I think, always the, uh, the, uh, the big um, discussion, my view is obviously that you have to bring it, or let's say that, so, so psychedelics, I think, are, are, were always seen in the last decades as sort of a, a counterculture, and I think they are still... Uh, a lot of people who want to see it as a counterculture because they felt sort of uh, they felt comfortable of being against something yeah but unfortunately because the need is so big because we have so many people who who can really be helped with those substances um, I think it needs to go into the center of our culture into it needs to become normal it needs to become a part of our society and from my point of view the only way to do it is to, to, uh, to approve it, what MAPS is working on, what we are working on, to approve it as a medication, which is not sort of done secretly in underground uh, therapies, but which is, we can talk about it openly. And I think we've come a great way, meaning we're sitting here yeah, and we're talking about it openly, we're talking about our own experiences. Yeah, and, and it needs to be very normal, it needs to be approved, and needs to be available um, in the clinical sort of world. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the approach yeah. and then obviously because I see the the chats going on then it's the question like how do you finance it? Yeah, and and Rick um, has come or has done the, the extremely uh, Cumbersome and long way yeah, to do it uh, as a non-profit 
which I always admire him for because uh, I know he's like 30 more, 30 years plus, yeah. Um, but I think we both agree because we see it with MDMA, what Rick is doing, and we see it with psilocybin, we see it with every single drug. If you, if you very simplify and say you need around about $100 million to bring one single drug into the, uh, the medical world, yeah. And that's high at the moment. So my company is working on seven of them. So even if I want it, there is no way, I think, to raise 700 million in a nonprofit way. It's hard enough for MAPS to raise the 100 million roundabout they need it and will need like four for MDMA. So, and this is where I think we have a very sort of win-win situation, yeah, um, to, uh, to sort of what we do, make a for-profit way uh, uh, so to raise money for investors, yeah, and bring it to the to the market as a drug. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the principal advantages of uh, the for-profit approach is access to capital. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, you know? Do you think we're going to be able to get this medicine out to the masses without involving a for-profit model, Rick? Well, I think, um, again, we're talking about psychedelic medicine. So even though we're focusing on um, MDMA, you know, Compass, others are focusing on psilocybin, really the goal is to have all these different psychedelics available for people. Uh, and, and the doctors, therapists, and the patients can sort of decide which to use in a sequence. So I think we will be able, I believe, you know, we're in a big fundraising challenge right now at COVID, the financial crisis. You know, we've got to raise a bunch more money now to bring MDMA to Europe. Um, Christian kindly offered to talk about investment. And, you know, I said, we're still going to try for donors. So I think that we will be able to um, hopefully bring MDMA through the system. And, and let me just mention that Victoria Hale is a new person that's joined our board of directors. And she worked at FDA for five years, worked at Genentech, got tired of for-profit pharma. She started a, a nonprofit company uh, called One World Institute for uh, parasites for India. And, and she got 150 million from the Gates Foundation. And then she got called by Susan Buffett, who wanted to see if she'd be interested in making a low-cost contraceptive for the world, and she got $60 million from the Buffetts. So these are the kinds of sums that Christian's talking about that we do need that have not been available from traditional foundations or governments. So I don't know that they, if we, as we destigmatize this and show that there's more support for it, maybe we'll be able to get um, funding of that sort for more nonprofit development. We are trying to think about an income stream from the sale of MDMA too. So that that's where we have the MAPS Public Benefit Corp, which is for profit, but it has the only investor being the nonprofit. And we will try to generate income for more research from the sale of MDMA, but it will when do you accumulate think slowly. When do you think MDMA will come online and be available, Rick? Well, assuming that we can start research again in a couple of months, uh, we're thinking near the end of 2022. And um, Rosalind, know. how about psilocybin? Sorry, in, in terms of psilocybin being available? Um, yeah, for patients. I, mean, I, really, I, re I really don't know. I'd say, I don't know, my guess would be five years' time, something like that. I would have been a little bit more optimistic, like two to three years. Let's see, yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious, how, how can we drive this forward in, in a model that, you know, embraces a for-profit mentality and, and bring, brings this to the masses in an ethical way? Yeah, well, there, there's one important point here, which, which we haven't talked about yet, which is drug policy reform and making it so people don't have to go to be part of a religion or they don't have to necessarily go to doctors or therapists, that they should be able to access this on their own in the system that I've been calling licensed legalization. And I think that then it becomes used for preventative medicine. It used, uh, people can do peer support. So I think we need parallel tracks. One is making it into a medicine. It's all covered hopefully eventually by insurance or national healthcare services. And I think those will be the harder cases. And I think we need to have a strategy that is based on human rights, based on drug policy reform that provides honest drug education, pure drugs, and uh, harm reduction efforts in a post-prohibition world as well. I think those both tracks are necessary. I'm really concerned about the, the recreationalization of these medications, man. Um, they, they are really strong. As a psychiatrist, I'm worried about 
the, the public health costs uh, that can be associated. So it, well, there are costs. I mean, it's a trade-off. I mean, th but the point is, it's already happening. Recreational use is already happening. And then, secondly, you know, is the criminal justice system the right way to address your concerns? The drug war has never really been about reducing drug abuse. It's always had a racist, uh, attack minorities, political agenda. It's never really been about reducing drug abuse. So while I share those concerns, I think there's other ways to address them than prohibition, and we sure. can accompany them with but, other kind of support systems. Yeah, Maybe no, one part, but like I think one one sort of friendly mistake we all making, and I think that's one of the big sort of uh, problems. So problem is too negative, but the, the big issues of the the psychedelic community is that we all, meaning I literally, I don't know if with you, Mark, but like everybody, I guess, in the call, I, you know, now on screen, and most, like, I guess, people who, who are in the chat have had uh, personal experiences with psychedelics in a recreational sort of personal setting. And you grow your mushrooms. And, and by the way, as a side note, just because my company has a patent on an artificial psilocybin, I always think a little bit that people might think I'm going to knock on their door and and take away their homegrown magic mushrooms. It's on artificial psilocybin, and everybody can grow psilocybin in the world, and we will not interfere. But like the problem is that the people, again, and a friendly problem, are talking about it have all taken it. But if we look, how many people? What is the percentage of the people in the world? Yeah, if I look in my friend circle, if I look at my parents, for example, my parents, I think old people, yeah, they start closing down. They would enormously profit from uh, from psychedelics they would never ever take it in a recreational setting. So I think that whole discussion about recreational setting and all of that is almost a fake discussion because it will, it's, it's addressing a tiny, tiny minority of people in the world who are open for that. I would say 99% of the people will never use any form of psychedelic or maybe 95, but a vast majority if it's not in a setting with a therapist, a doctor, in sort of a controlled setting, because they're afraid of it, or they don't even think about it. They would never make the step we all would make. Yeah? And this is why I don't see at all that whole discussion about, oh, like the people who use it frequently against the people who do it, like us for profit, like and develop it for the patient. Like we need to focus, my favorite example is the Netherlands. Yeah? You can go to Amsterdam, yeah, you can get psychedelics in the Netherlands, let's say psilocybin, in a coffee shop. Yeah, yeah, you can get your magic truffles. And still, the Netherlands has the same amount of depressive people who have not access to psychedelics, although they have. They just go to a coffee shop and buy it, but they don't because they need it from their doctor because that's the way these people want it. Well, look how it's presented in Holland. I mean, it's, it's sold alongside other recreational intoxicants. Uh, you have alcohol next door, pizza next door, and mushrooms all in the same strip. In a nice way. So it's not, it's not bad at all. Like, it's positive, but still 99% of Dutch people don't take it. Because, I don't know, they don't have the impetus. They don't dare to do it. I don't know why. I Meaning, because I can't... I mean, it's a different message from being an intoxicant to being a medicine that can raise human consciousness and vibration, man. And that's what, you know, I'm curious about what your guys' idea is. Also, like, can... let, me, let me put in here, because we already jump again, and I'm extremely personally open for that, for the whole spiritual side of that, but we almost jump immediately, oh, let's raise consciousness. But if I look at my parents, they don't even understand the discussion, but they would still profit of being more happy, yeah? So I think we, we sort of, and funnily, I think sometimes people are, are saying, oh, I'm an elitist, I'm a capitalist, whatever. And I think actually the psychedelic community is extremely elitist because they think the way they, the community thinks, oh, we are enlightened and we speak to God and da, 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 is like the rest of the world is thinking. And no, there are a lot of people who don't think like us. They don't actually want even to be enlightened. Actually, my, my fear is even when the doctor then has to say, hey, I, I offer you, the therapist says, you can do psychedelics, but I have to tell you, we're gonna confront your fears, we're gonna be enlightened. I bet the majority of people says, hell no, I don't want that. I don't want to confront my fears. I don't wanna be enlightened. I just want to solve my depression. 
you know, so we should, a little bit more, we should a little bit more focus, not on the recreational side, because everybody can do that. And I bet everybody who wants to do recreational psychedelics is doing recreational psychedelics. We should no, focus no, no. on... Well, I, I would say no, that, that because people don't know, people are reluctant to take... Uh, a risk on criminals. They're, they're not always sure that they can grow their own mushrooms. I know, so, yeah, but grow it at your home. And I, I, I saw, but well, you know what I mean? Like, but like there, I, I, I want to bring it back that there are like 300 million people yeah, who have depression, who really suffer, who are patients, who don't do it for fun, who don't do it for enlightenment. Yeah. If they will hopefully someone do it, they're doing to solve uh, depression, which is really fucking up their lives. Yeah. I'm curious, Rosalind, um, the, the patients that you've been seeing, are, are they mostly coming in really to focus on their biologic depression or, or are they looking bigger about expanding consciousness? Um, most people come in suffering from severe depression and they've tried very many other treatments and they really only try psilocybin because it's, um, it's the only thing they haven't, they haven't tried yet often. So people have often tried lots of different types of antidepressants and they've tried talking therapy and, you know, they've read something in the paper about psilocybin, so they give it a go. But <clears throat> usually they're not, they're not interested in the more kind of spiritual aspects of it until perhaps they might be more interested in that afterwards sometimes. Exactly. They might get, they might get interested, but it's not their goal. Their goal is to solve a clinical condition. Yeah. And, and what do you think about these medications being more first line possibly? for these clinical conditions? Um, it, should, they, should people have to go through two different antidepressants before they can try these medicines? Rosalind, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the, the current study, the one we've just finished, was looking at major depressive disorder for, for it, precisely that reason, so that it wouldn't be that there was an indication of treatment-resistant depression only, so that it could be something that people could access with major depressive disorder rather than treatment-resistant depression. Um, but I think we're still so far away from this point of, of even considering this as a, as a treatment for depression when we still don't really understand the mechanisms. So we're still at a point now where we understand a little bit about the acute mechanisms and, and perhaps the, um, the mechanisms in the brain. We're just starting to look at that too. But in terms of clinical mechanisms, we really are at the beginning of this. So even this whole conversation about you know, how it will look as this kind of like this treatment, I, it feels to me that we're we're quite a long way from that. And I, I guess the things that I think we need before we can even really consider mainstreaming are structures. And that's um, clinical structures, and that's for therapists in terms of training, supervision, mentorship, having a um, solidity in the practice and sharing amongst each other and a real solid understanding of what we're doing, some, developing some theory, developing some practice. So structures for the clinicians, structures for the participants, the patients, social structures, integration structures, you know, our society will have to shift in order for this to be accepted. So for our parents to want to do something like this, it is about education, but it's also about after having done it, being able to, to kind of have some follow-up um, support from other people that have, have gone through the same kind of thing rather than just having one experience and then going back to life as it was before. So social structures, clinical structures, and also ethical structures, because I think before we even consider mainstreaming, we have to really get our own house in order. And there are lots of problems with the psychedelic um, field at the moment. Um, there, are, we, there are still many things that need to be, to be worked on and, and solved. So I think we need the structures before we can even think about this as a huge treatment that's going to serve you know, millions of people. Can you please name the biggest problem that you see right now in the industry? I would say, Probably the biggest problem is the idea that psychedelics are inherently good and that psychedelics have an inherently beneficial um, impact because, in fact, they're non-specific amplifiers. So the way people take them, the setting they take them in, the people they take them with and the intentions that they have for it will um, affect the outcome. And, of course, people think of psychedelics as being these, um, these medicines, these tools for ego dissolution, and we certainly see that in hydrocilocybin sessions often. But in some settings, they seem to be able to uh, amplify the ego, increase the ego. So one of the problems we see in the psychedelic community is um, kind of psychedelic related narcissism. And it's something that I think people that work within the field are, are, are seeing more and more of. And that is this idea that, you know, there's this magical quality about it often. Access to these other states of consciousness, this kind of amazing feeling of, of magical mystery. 
And I think if that's harnessed in a, in a safe, grounded way with good therapeutic support and understanding of what that effect is, then that can be, can be really helpful for people. For someone with depression, for example, it can be really beneficial. But I think often um, in the psychedelic community, there are these lots of kind of little businesses popping up. We see them popping up all the time. These little businesses which are about, um, you know, I even saw reference to a psychedelic stylist at one of these psychedelic conferences, which was someone to help you create like your psychedelic style. And it seems to be this kind of like the, the, the narcissism that can, that can come from these tools is, um, is the thing that worries me the most. I have to actually, I totally agree. I, I was like, yeah, I'm uh, on the one, I'm, I'm personally very spiritual, but I, I, I sort of in a certain way despise organized religions because I think organized religions always creates that I have I own, the, I own the wisdom and I have the only God and the others are all false gods. And I always thought like psychedelics should make you open and like more yeah, open-minded, but unfortunately it creates the same amount of celiots, or I think that's the English term, like of religious extremists, yeah, who think now that they found the wisdom. Yeah, uh, they know exactly how it is. They're gonna shut down everybody else. We do have people in the chat, if I'm reading that, who seem to have fallen into, uh, into that trap. Yeah, um, and I think that's what worries me the most as well. How about you, Rick? Um, well, the biggest problem, I, I, uh, the biggest challenge is training more therapists. So I don't know if I would put that as a problem in the sense that, um, but I think that because we're talking about um, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, even with psilocybin, there's preparation, integration, support during, um, I think that that's going to be a challenge to properly train the therapists so that we can really scale it. Because when you think about our treatment, so first of all, I'll say MDMA will be a first line treatment for PTSD. It's not going to be for treatment resistant people, but our current approach is 42 hours of therapy with two people. So roughly one week of um, two therapists. So they can only do, you know, 30, 40 people a year in that protocol and there's 8 million people just in the United States with PTSD. So figuring out how to properly scale the therapists and the number of them, I think, is the biggest challenge. Um, for me, the biggest problem um, is this fundraising um, challenge, you know, because we're, we are trying to see how will we be different post-approval than a for-profit. You know, are there specific advantages, you could say, to nonprofit drug development where you maximize public benefit over profit you know will that make it so that we can uh, mainstream it more quickly or will it make it more easily adopted or you know will we share more information with others rather than trying to lock everything up in patents so it's not clear to me um, you know we're gonna have to do a good job I think of, of what are the differences and that would be something good for us to talk about with with Christian but I think that um, for me when I look at the real challenge to mainstreaming it's the training of therapists i agree i agree with you rick absolutely yeah where are your therapists trained rosalind um so this is something we've been thinking a lot a lot about recently so we don't have a formal therapist training um structure at imperial we've done the training so originally bill richards from johns hopkins provided some mentorship and early training for the first study and then from that we've developed a model and we've done some in-house training so we've had some holotropic breathwork training from our uh, clinical supervisor, which was really helpful. And we've, we've formed our own in-house training, but we realized that we, we need to go much, much deeper uh, in future. So we're starting to think about how we, could, um, how we could set up something that would serve not only the, our population of, of researchers at Imperial, therapists, therapist guides at Imperial and other UK sites, but also just all the other you know, organizations and, and people that need this kind of um, expertise. So a colleague of mine at Imperial, Christopher Timmerman, has developed the idea of a center for psychedelic apprenticeship. And that would be a center where we, we, we look to the experts in the field. There are so many people that have been doing this for decades and they have so much experience that we so need to, to learn from, the elders really. And it would be about sharing their knowledge and their expertise and not just like um, knowledge theory head stuff, but actually experiential learning like lots of role plays what do you actually do in this tricky situation role play it out trying it this way trying it that way getting all the different experts in to give us their perspectives 
and just having it as a place where we would, it wouldn't be a training school because I know that there'll be training, like Compass will have a training and Maps have a training, all the different places will have their training, but it would be a place of really, really going deep with the, with the experiential elements and trying to just have a place where people can share because one of the, the other threats I see is that with a for-profit model, there's this thing about intellectual property and, and, and the idea that, you know, people are going to take little bits of, of the, the puzzle and keep it safe. And, you know, the, when it comes to clinical expertise <clears throat> and managing risk, that is something that all therapists need to have access to, to, that, to that information. So, yeah, that, that's what we want to develop. So really important uh, in this for-profit model, how do we all communicate and share and not compete against one another? Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what I'm hearing is we need to to create a standardized training protocol and program for therapists. Instead, we have 30 different organizations vying uh, for this market share. Well, but I don't think it's that bad, by the way. First of all, we, we're all in the chat together. Like, and I, like, uh, I, I, I work with Rick, we work with uh, Rosamond, we work with Imperial. I think that I have the feeling that sort of the, the key players yeah, who have the same mindset and value set do work together pretty well. And I also think it's like, meaning I agree that there is a, a shortage of therapists and there is a, uh, and, and a training, but again, we're talking about bringing something completely new to the market. And that always is sort of a, a progress and a progress and a process. Yeah? yeah. And positively said, my hope is that Meaning we do have a lot of therapists in the world, not psychedelic therapists, but normal therapists who spend hundreds of hours on patients. I don't want to say without success, but with very slow success because they don't have the tools uh, uh, psychedelic therapy can, can offer them and their parents. So my hope is that, again, after like sort of an adjustment time, because we need to train those people, but there are enough therapists. And I actually sometimes I have the opposite discussions where therapists are asking me in, 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 in in questions uh, like, oh, are we going to be all unemployed? Yeah, And I think it will exactly match because sort of, I always tell them, look, hopefully in the future with the use of psychedelics, you can actually be more effective. That means every single patient hopefully doesn't need hundreds of hours, which don't really work because you have now much more effective tool. But in return, you can actually treat way more people. Yeah, You just need to get trained. So long story short, I think there will be like a, like a, what is it called, like a, an, an interim period yeah, where people need to get trained and accustomed. But then yeah, I think once all therapists, hopefully in an ideal world in the world, are accustomed to it, yeah, I think there will be enough. And maybe even more because it becomes like a more, I know so many therapists who are very frustrated because they don't have the tools yet to help really their patients. Uh, so maybe being a therapist becomes even a cooler job, so to say, because now people will say, oh, I have the tools now, I want to be like, there, I think, again, and I know some people will hate me for that sentence, which I'm saying now, but I believe in the market. The market will solve it. Once the, once the, the therapies are in the market yeah, and people can get trained, yeah, again, there might be an in-between shortage, but then yeah, the market will solve it. Rick, how, 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 what market? how are we going to train all these people, man? Well, I think, you know, we are trying to scale up our training program right now. Uh, one thing that, uh, Raz, you're talking about experiential learning. You didn't really mention about uh, whether therapists should have their own experiences with psilocybin or not. I mean, I didn't mention it because I think it's just so obvious it hardly needs saying. I mean, the idea that you would like, you know, it's, you know, the idea is like trying to teach someone to drive when you've never driven a car yourself. I mean, it, to me, it's just absolutely ridiculous, the idea that somebody would, would attempt to do that because the participants always ask us if we've had our own experience and what would you say in the prep session? Oh, actually, no, I don't want to take it, but you know, good luck, have a, have a nice time. No. Yeah, we're, we're still now arguing with FDA about expanding our program, our protocol to give MDMA to therapists. So they're, they're, we've done it to over um, almost 90 people so far with uh, no long lasting problems at all and a lot of benefits, but they're, getting a little bit nervous about further protocol. So we're negotiating that with FDA. Uh, Rick, yeah. what do you think about therapists? Do you think they need to do this type of medicine before they can do this type of work? No, no, I think that it helps. So I wouldn't make it a requirement. I, I think we should never require anybody to do a drug. It should always be voluntary, even for the therapists. But at the same time, the way I look at it is that if you're a therapist, 
and you come back, come, come with your own skills, whatever, you will be more effective if you've done the drug that you want to give to people. It doesn't mean that everybody that's done the drug that's a therapist is better than every therapist that's never done the drug. It just means that each therapist will be more effective if they have understand what's going on. So for example, in the eight hour MDMA session, roughly half the time, people's eyes are closed, they're listening to music, they're having these internal experiences. Therapists are cued in on body language and how they're doing. Um, and then the rest of the time is dialogue. With psilocybin LSD, it's more like 90% of the time or so that they're having their own inner experience. And you need the therapist to have an understanding what's going on in these quiet moments. How do they support them? So I think that uh, it should never be required, but it should be an option. Rosalind? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I can't imagine. I mean, we, we have many therapists getting in touch with us wanting to be involved in psilocybin work. And um, we, we, yeah, we have had some people that have come along and done a bit of training with us that haven't had psilocybin experiences themselves. And the, the, the amount of, I mean, the difference in terms of the, the awareness, the understanding, and just the... The, the sensitivity, like Rick was saying, to, to what it feels like to be in that state, it's, it's almost, you'd have to do so much extra work with somebody to try and impart this information. And these states are so difficult to understand if you haven't been in them, that even you could try and train someone for five years and you'd still not do it. Whereas, you know, one psilocybin experience would go much further in helping them understand what it's like. So it doesn't make any sense to me that anybody that hadn't had it would be, would be working with somebody in that state. Um, Mark, Mark, there's one thing um, the, about um, nonprofit and for-profit helping each other, and and I want to say that that um, you know, uh, Atai is now interested in ibogaine, and is working with Deborah Mash, and Maps was interested in ibogaine as well, and so I've been thinking, and, and and Chris and I I think need more time to sort of talk how we collaborate with this, but I'm thinking that whatever we do, since we're going to share the information in a public way, it will benefit. Um, for-profit approaches, and that's fine. We want to benefit them. It's not like we we want them to succeed. We want the patients to have access, and if they can get access faster through um, a tie and they've got the capital, but then I had to, to decide, should we just give up? Should we just let a tie do it? And you know, we, we don't really have much funds for um, Ibogaine, but we're gonna try to do what's called a pre-IND meeting with I, Ibogaine with the FDA to talk about the risks to the heart, what would be a safety study. And so I think whatever progress we're able to make will be helpful to, uh, to a tie to others. So I think that it's, it's very clear that we want everybody to succeed. Yeah, no, same here. What's well, the I just wanna say one, one, one idea, like, uh, because I, the, my main thing is like, people should always be truthful. I'm always jokingly say, but it's true. Like I'm, I'm a capitalist and I'm very proud of that, but like, what I always don't like is that so many people say, oh, this should all be an, a non-profit world. Yeah. yeah. And then I meet Rick and I'm like, oh, you must be flooded by money, small donations, big donations, because so many people think it should be non-profit, but people say it, but don't act on it. So first of all, I want to say, because it was in the chat, but like, yeah, you can donate. So if you believe in the non-profit yeah. world, then act on it yeah, and donate to MAPS. And second, because people will say, oh, he can say that, yeah, because he's rich, yeah, I'm, I'm going to match every donation. Uh, and Rick doesn't know that. It's not a, it's not, <laughs> it's not a theater thing that really set me up. But like, yeah, but like, whatever is donated uh, in that session here now, I'm going to match um, uh, 5x. So, so if you want to get a lot of money from me, then you need to get <laughs> a lot of money to Rick now because I'm going to match it five times so you can make me really you can make me really poor now wow christian uh, maybe i should take several of our million dollars and round exactly it no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so and i do expect everybody who was critical in the chat yeah uh, with for profit to show up on the donation list for maps with a really big pickup i, I i'd also like to say that uh, sorry to interrupt you there christine but i'm actually also quite critical of the for profit model as well so i'm not there okay with, go uh, online uh, yeah maybe uh, rather than donating anything to maps although i'm incredibly grateful to rick and yeah, yeah. i think yeah. maps is an incredible organization and i'm really humbled by the work and i hope that psilocybin can follow the same model in some ways because it's it's an amazing um, framework. 
um, and very, you know, at its core, deeply ethical, especially the North Star project, which I just wanted yeah. to name. Oh, great. But, great. Um, the reason I'm not going to donate to MAPS for Christian to very kindly match it is because what I'm going to do instead right. is I'm gonna mention an alternative model, which is um, it's something that's been developed by um, an economist called Bennett Zellner. Oh, yeah. And it's called the pollinator model. So if you're, if you're not sure about the for-profit model or the not-for-profit model, then the pollinator model is something people might be really interested in. You can, you can look it up online. It's, it's a very interesting uh, new model for, for bringing psilocybin and psychedelics to, to people at scale, <clears throat> but it's done in a um, community-driven way. So it's essentially, um, it's, it's making psilocybin available, but by doing it with smaller decentralized communities. And so I'm not going to go into the details of it, but I just wanted to bring that up because I think it, it has a lot of promise. Yeah, but Raz, I would say that what he's talking about is the distribution of psychedelic clinics and how to organize them and whether there would be one organization that has, you know, hundreds of psychedelic clinics and owns them all or whether there would be local ownership. But he's, he's, he's post the approval trying to figure out how. The, the other thing I'd like to say to, to oh, Krujan. Sorry. Oh. sorry, I just wanted to say that his model, the pollinator pro model, rests on the idea that the the um the, the psilocybin would be not for profit psilocybin so usona obviously are trying to provide psilocybin that's not for profit so the the whole pollinator model can only come about if, if psilocybin that is licensed is from a not-for-profit um, I, I didn't get that impression from him you know that, that let's say compass makes psilocybin into a medicine and they succeed and they're likely to be ahead of usona that there can still be how the clinics are set up can still be done in Bennett's model with local ownership of the clinics and then they get certified by Compass. So it, it's, it doesn't have to be from a nonprofit. But, but I want to say one other thing about the for-profit, nonprofit model that, that, that I share a concern. And Kristen, I think you did really well the, the way you described how it's essential that we go through the FDA. You weren't so sure that it matters that much if it's available you know, in a post-prohibition world. But you didn't condemn the effort. So I just want to, uh, to, to make it Legal. No, but I, and I, but, I, I want to say one yeah. thing. I, want, I, I yeah. think that the thing is like it shouldn't be illegal. It shouldn't be illegal. So I think that the decriminalization is important. Yeah, yes. because nobody of us should go to jail ever for uh, being found in the car with mushrooms or MDMA, whatever. Yeah, but like that doesn't solve the problem. That's sort of a, a how you say a, in English. Sorry, it's always like when you're German. Like uh, it's the, a, a necessary condition. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, also comes hand in hand because if the FDA will make something legal as a medicine, it will be very hard to, har to harshly criminalize it on the other side. So that's sort of the, I think the, the le legalization as a medicine also is positively supporting the decriminalization effort because it makes it, it makes it more like tangible for the authority. Yeah. Yeah. So when, yeah. Yeah. Right now there's this dichotomy where something, it, can be FDA approved, but very illegal if it's not used in that medical model. Well, but the, the stigma that produces the high crime, high penalties for non-medical use will go down as it's, and we've it's seen okay, that I, with marijuana. The medicalization of marijuana has led to legalization. I just want to um, sort of praise Christian in a way for it being nuanced because we have the alternative is J.R. Ron from Mind Medicine in Forbes just said, uh, this isn't the 60s all over again. I want nothing to do with those kind of folks who want to decriminalize psychedelics. So he's somehow thinking that their success in this, uh, whatever they're going to be doing, is contingent upon being only medical and condemning drug policy reform. So I think that's a really wrong direction. And that that is one of the concerns that I, I think um, Christian does not share that view with J.R. Ron and has been, you know, more, much more willing to, um, you know, talk about the dual tracks. It, so it sounds like that, that's going to be really key is embracing decriminalization and medicalization at the same time, which is going to be a new construct for us in the U.S. Yeah, and, and I don't think that Compass or USONA or um, Mind Medicine even needs to do like we're doing, which is really, we're, we're trying to work it out so that in Denver, where uh, mushrooms are the lowest enforcement priority, we're actually working. Sarah Gale, who's part of our Zendo Psychedelic Harm Reduction Project, is on the mayor's committee, the city council's committee, to help implement and how that mushrooms get used in Denver. And so she'll be educating the police, educating the ER rooms, the doctors, on how to respond if people have difficult trips. But so we're trying to make decrim work out. But I think that the primary focus 
And all of this change is coming through the FDA route, through the EMA route, through that route. That's absolutely essential, but yeah, it can be a parallel track. In closing, Rick, I, I'm curious, can, can you please let us know one last message you'd, you'd like to, to say about what's going to be important in the future of psychedelics? Um, well, I think that in the past, we had this idea that, um, you know, we've talked about psychedelic narcissism and this idea that you've had your experiences and now you are more enlightened than everybody else. And that taken to an extreme, in a sense, was like, um, you know, the counterculture, that we're all against society. We are now part of the counterculture. So I think what's going to be essential has been um, really bringing this to all groups. So we, are act, we have a, actually a police psychotherapist who's going through our training program to give MDMA therapy to police with trauma. We, we have a, a military psychiatrist at Walter Reed, 32 year psychiatrist, expert in PTSD, going through our training program to give MDMA to act, active duty soldiers. We need to give it to first responders, to healthcare workers. So I think we really need to see this as something for the whole broad spectrum. And we also need to try to um, not fall into this. I've been, one of the things I've gotten a lot of criticism for was accepting um, donations from people that are on um, conservative side of things or are perceived to be on the conservative side of things, like uh, Rebecca Mercer from the Mercer family. And yet I think building those kind of bridges is what's absolutely ne necessary. So I think we really need to think about this as a bipartisan approach for helping humans and that afterwards you don't have to say, oh, every Republican is going to turn into a Democrat or, you know, it's just whatever they want to do. It's, it's sort of mainstream for people who are suffering. I won't even go into yeah. political yeah. discussion because yeah. I totally agree because it's like if somebody says that, by the way, whatever you believe politically, if somebody says that by psychedelics, you're surely turning into ABC, it's already such a form of narcissism. It's yeah. unbelievable yeah. because you always have to hear and value other people's perspective. And it might not be what you believe. I also think you... Yeah, you should listen to it. That doesn't mean you need to like it. That doesn't mean you need, you need to change. But I normally think that everybody who I talk to has an interesting point I want to learn about. Again, it doesn't mean that I have to adapt it. Yeah, and the other person shouldn't also expect it. I, but you know what I mean? So that's all. Yeah, totally great. I Christian, <laughs> last thought about the future in psychedelics, please. Well, I, I just think it's bright and it's diverse. Yeah. Um, and uh, But ultimately, positively, we're going to help and that's what I'm very proud of. And that I think every, every single person working in the field uh, in its own way uh, can be very proud of. There, first of all, unfortunately, there are hundreds of millions of people who need it. And yeah. positively, yeah, we're gonna change the lives of hundreds of millions of people very positively. Wonderful, positivity. Rosalind. Well, I'm very lucky to, to, in some ways, to live in the UK and to have experienced the National Health Service my whole life. Um, and so I've experienced um, healthcare that comes from a purely uh, health uh, care driven um, provider. It's free at the point of access. And so my, my wish for the psychedelics is that psychedelic care and the models that um, c come in and come into play will be, will maintain that kind of care driven focus that I've experienced myself. Because although the tools that we have available in, in, in the NHS in terms of talking therapy aren't maybe the strongest tools, not as strong as psychedelics. The people that give that therapy, the people that provide that treatment are often very um, driven by care rather than profit. So I, I hope that we can, um, yeah, that, that, that we can see that kind of structure where psilocybin would be um, available to as many people as possible. But in a structure like that, that's my wish. Thank you, Rosalind. And once more, donate to Rick. Thank you so much, yes, Chris. Please. What an amazing thank panel. You so much. Please thank donate. You so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks, okay, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye. Before we just say goodbye to all me. the attendees, um, I'd like to thank you all guys for joining us tonight, the panelists, to Dr. Mark Bronstein. It was an amazing, amazing discussion, really interesting. And I would just like to remind everybody that on May 6th, we'll be having another webinar um, about Put Your Money Where Your Mind Is, uh, the investment landscape with Bruce Linton, Alex Spicer, Jay Shri Mitra, and our own Chaim Racklaw from SciTech. And then May 25th and 26th is a SciTech Summit, um, where you'll be hearing some of these wonderful panelists speak again 
um, live with live Q and A. So thank you guys again. Incredible night. Thank you. Stay healthy. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.